Rugrats All Growed Up is a 2D platformer for Windows based on the cartoon Rugrats. If you grew up in the 90s or the early 2000s, there's a pretty good chance you remember it. Specifically, this game is based on the series' 10th anniversary special episode, All Growed Up, which features the titular baby character zapped into the future, growing 10 years older on the way. Not exactly all growed up, but as a kid, hitting double digits seemed like a pretty big deal. The special later got spun off into its own mini-series, All Grown Up, with an N. Mm. But this game came out before that, just a few months after the original special episode's release in 2001. Sure, it might seem like a dubious choice to pick an obscure and likely terrible kids game for my first review, but since you're here, I'd like to invite you to sit back, grab a drink, and watch me kill my YouTube channel before it's even started. Right upon launching the game, we get a cutscene that outlines the game's plot. The Rugrats are sitting down watching a show about the mad scientist Dr. Spooky who's just invented the world's first time machine. Angelica is understandably skeptical. Dr. Spooky's about to go to the future! No, he's not! Because there's no such thing as a time machine, you dumb babies! But Chucky has some words of wisdom. But he said there is. And if you believe in something, even a time machine, it will happen. Oh, uh, really? Yes, really. All it takes is a firm belief and anything can happen. And I don't mean anything. We're not babies anymore! Now that we're here, Dr. Spooky tells us that the only way to get back to the way we were is to find his plans for an untime machine and build it. Will you help us? Yeah, so that made no fucking sense. I think I'm gonna have to give this game a zero for plot right off the bat. What kind of fucking motive does this guy have to suck a bunch of kids into a fucking television set and then just, you know, shrug your shoulders and go, oh, I guess you gotta help me build my new machine now, I guess, or whatever. Uh, okay, I get it. It's a bunch of babies and their overactive imaginations. It's not supposed to make any sense. Uh, whatever, but... Uh, Alright, let's move on to the actual game. After making a save file and selecting a character, we find ourselves on the game's hub screen. The only things we're able to select seem to be this purple door, or this green question mark thing in the center. Seems to be a help or tutorial thing of some sort, so I guess we'll go with that first. Oh awesome, a tutorial! I guess now I can learn how to play the game and get used to the controls and um, uh, oh. Okay, so apparently it's just a video recording of someone else playing the game. I don't actually get to interact with this at all. Alright, uh, good tutorial, thanks for that. Alright, let's get into the game for real now. First impressions are not great. The game controls horrendously, so much as tapping the left or right arrow keys will make you walk an unreasonably long way, and jumping from a stand still sends you bounding forward too. Moving just a little bit is impossible. And did I mention the torture my ears are going through right now? Every time I jump, Tommy lets out a tremendous bellowing grunt. And Angelica's running commentary on basically everything that happens got very annoying very fast. Was falling part of your plan? Wow, you grabbed all the spooky spheres. Nice job, you juvenile. The background music is leaving a lot to be desired too. It doesn't even loop nicely. It fades out after around 30 seconds and then starts over from the beginning. About halfway through the level, there's this puzzle where you have to unlock a door by matching up some lights with a set of coloured clocks. Stopping the spinning globe on a colour would change the lights to match that colour, but there didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason as to which light would actually change. Eventually, as a result of trial and error, I got it to work by moving forward, then backward, then forward, and then backward again. I thought that maybe I'd miss something and that maybe the direction I had to spin the globe would be the same direction as whichever direction the clock hands were moving or whatever, but I looked and thought about it, and as far as I can tell, the direction the clock hands are pointing seems to be completely insignificant and random. Even if that was the case, I doubt this game's target demographic would be expected to work out something that complex anyway. This was a fun little puzzle, but it would have been a lot more user-friendly if the lights just lit up in the correct order from left to right regardless of the direction you turn the globe. The remainder of the first level is filled with other little gimmicks and puzzles like this along the way. A book ladder which you can only climb when the correct buttons are pressed, a train ride where you have to dodge books falling from the ceiling, 
I'm glad the game seems to have spots like this that break up the monotony of walking around and climbing ladders. Each level in the game is filled with these collectibles called Spooky Spheres. When you get half of them, you get this message from Dr. Spooky. You found half of my missing Spooky Spheres! Find the other half and I'll reward you! Turns out, collecting all the spheres in the level opens one of the locked doors I passed earlier. Though there's no indication of this happening, and the door itself is pretty nondescript, so you wouldn't know unless you tried it again just for the sake of checking. And my great reward for collecting all the spooky spheres is... An entire room full of even more spooky spheres. All I get for my hard work is to finish the level with a slightly higher score. I guess my real reward here is the childlike satisfaction from hearing that collection sound effect ringing in my ears. Yeah, nah. So with all that done with, you can end the level by pressing a button to open a chute which you jump into and find Dr. Spooky's book at the other side. And then this happens. Ugh. After you clear the first level, you unlock three more at once. The attic, the greenhouse, and basement. I decided to go around in counterclockwise order because, well, why not? The main gimmick here in the attic is to press buttons to turn off dangerous electricity to gain access to different parts of the level. Straightforward enough. The layout confused the living fuck out of me though. In contrast to the relatively linear form of the first stage, this level was a fever dream of opening random doors, dodging flying spiders, and never having a fucking clue where I was. Apparently I didn't do too badly though, because I finished the stage in what felt like half the time of the first. Yep, I guess there's one of these after every level. Oh boy. So next up we have this greenhouse level. Interesting theme, I guess. We actually get some different music this time too. Angelica is, of course, still annoying as ever. Was falling part of your plan? Brilliant. Seriously, sometimes there are points in the level where it's faster to navigate just by dropping off of ledges, but every time I do it, Angelica here feels the need to comment on it. Here we have some perfectly good fruit coming straight out of a mechanical pipe and splatting down onto the cold ground into useless mush. A pretty apt and thought-provoking metaphor for the wastage of excess produce under the capitalist mode of production, but I doubt that's what the developers had in mind there. So throughout the level so far, there's been these red doors embedded into trees that won't open until you press the corresponding button to unlock them. At some point I run into this closed door here, so naturally I turn around to backtrack and find the button that unlocks it. I spend the next minute or so scrambling around the level searching to no avail before I eventually, out of sheer desperation, come back and try opening it manually. And guess what? It opened. All of the knowledge I'd built up over the course of this level of these red tree doors being unlocked by pressing buttons had betrayed me, going against everything I'd learned so far. This ticked me off a bit because it felt like more of an issue of bad game design than anything wrong with my own thinking. This big monster plant looks dangerous, but it also looks like it's sleeping, so I should be good to- Holy fuck, that thing just ate a kid alive! Hey, I'm okay. Apparently being swallowed whole isn't enough to take dill pickles out of commission. Please, don't overfeed my plants or they'll go to sleep! So according to Dr. Spooky, to get past this giant child-eating plant, we need to put it to sleep by giving it something to eat. The solution to this conundrum is to knock this giant peach down from its branch, presumably feeding the plant beneath it. Yep, looks pretty well fed to me. And fast asleep too, just like the doctor said. Fuck reviewing games, I should be a gardener. So now we can jump over the, uh, sleeping plant, turn on the sprinklers, jump on down here, Great jump. climb up the vine, and that's it, because as everyone who did high school science knows, a giant eggplant is an essential component of any time machine. Yes, I will be putting all of these abominations in the video. Next up is the basement, where the music has again returned to the track from the first and second levels. Really digging the variety here. The monsters of the week in this stage are steam spewing pipes, a return of the spooky bats from the second level, and cardboard boxes. Yep, they kill you if you touch them. You know, I'm really glad they're not trying to skirt around the dangers of cardboard boxes in this game. It's an issue I feel really isn't talked about enough. So aside from the intimidating obstacles, this level's pretty straightforward. 
You push a button to lower a ladder, which you then climb up to find another button that stops Dr. Spooky's wacky robot here. Which brings us to the end of the level and our ever titillating congratulations screen. Luckily that's the last one. But we've still got one more level before we're done here. Once all the other stages are clear, the doorway to the final level is opened. To clear this stage and finish the game, we need to set the hands on this big clock to point to the corresponding coloured dots. The level's divided into two halves. At the end of each is a door leading to an area where one hand on the clock can be adjusted. This stage actually has some relatively neat mechanics, the main one being these digital clocks that need to be stopped at the right time to match their counterparts to disable laser fields that are blocking your path. This mechanic crops up twice. On one occasion, three clocks need to be matched to three others to turn off electrical currents to open the way for you to take an elevator down past them, and another occasion where two clocks both need to be stopped so that the same time appears on both. Nothing incredibly innovative here, but still a neat little kid-friendly puzzle to solve. Other highlights are these death balls that periodically fire in five different directions, and... Did I mention the lab rats? <laughs> yeah, because they're rats in a lab with goofy little glasses. Yeah, you think that's funny. In other news, the music here is just the same as the greenhouse level again. Really mixing it up. Seriously, they couldn't do better than two songs for five levels? I later discovered that the game in fact includes five different tracks for the main levels, and the game just picks one at random when you start a level. This just seems really fucking counterintuitive. Why not assign one of these five tracks to each of the five levels so the player is guaranteed some sort of variety? I played the whole game through and only heard two of the game's five 30 second music loops. Admittedly, I didn't really miss out on much, but still, what a thoughtless design move. Five tracks, five levels, it makes sense? Why can't this game just make sense? Anyway. Once you're done setting both of the clock hands, you just backtrack to the beginning of the level, hit a button, you get a 10 second ending cutscene, and that's the game. Despite my impressive high score of 13,490, the T-Rex character Reptar remains a shadowy silhouette on the character select screen, which is weird because I distinctly remember unlocking and playing as him as a kid. In retrospect, you probably unlock him by collecting all the spooky spheres in each of the different levels, which I didn't do because I really didn't care that much. If you want me to go back and give that a try, well, too bad, because I'm not doing that. You can probably guess what my verdict for this game is gonna be. Nostalgia really couldn't save this one for me, it's just not a good game. The controls are janky, the music is unappealing and repetitive, the plot doesn't make any sense. There's just really not a whole lot here for a lover of platformers to enjoy. Oh, now, I suppose you could make the argument that it's unfair of me to judge a kid's game from 2001 to a set of standards that really shouldn't be applied to such low-hanging fruit, and that making a 10-minute video review of this game is probably just a bad idea in general. Um, and you'd be spot on about that. But it's not all gloom and doom for Rugrats all grown up. The environments can be pretty creative and many of the puzzles are at just the right difficulty level for kids to get some satisfaction from solving them. At least when they work correctly. This also could have been a really monotonous game, but thankfully each level has some mildly interesting gimmicks to break up all the walking and ladder climbing. Overall, I give Rugrats all grown up one and a half stars for being pretty crappy, but not completely atrocious. And thanks, by the way, for watching my probably not so great first video all the way through to the end. Um, if you're here from a distant future where my channel takes off and ends up being somewhat successful and you come back to see the first video um, to see where everything began, hello! And uh, otherwise, also hello. And regardless of where you sit on the space-time continuum, um, it would be fantastic if you subs could um, subscribe and, you know, stay tuned for any videos coming up in the future because it really does help a ton. Uh, thanks a lot for watching. Um, and hopefully we will see each other again real soon, whenever the next video comes out, or... Yeah, later.